Concepts of Biology Chapter 20 covers ecosystems and the biosphere. An ecosystem is a community of living organisms and their non-living environment. So the weather that they live in, water, soil, and all of those wonderful things. Ecosystems can be really tiny, like a little, little tidal pool next to the ocean, or it can be something as large as the Amazon rainforest in Brazil. The ecology of ecosystems. Life involves competition for limited resources, which occurs between members of a single species and between members of all different types of species. They're fighting for water, food, sunlight, space to build homes, and even mineral nutrients. When we look at the components of the physical environment, we can kind of see which of these resources might be the most important. We have to consider a habitat's climate, elevation, and its geology. Animals that live in the desert are going to spend a lot more time looking for water than animals that live in the rainforest. We focus on three major groups of ecosystems. Those that are freshwater, those that are marine, and those that are terrestrial. Freshwater ecosystems are the least common and they account for only 1.8% of the ecosystems on Earth. They include lakes, rivers, streams, and springs. They're very diverse and you can find quite a few different life sources or um, you can find quite a few different species in them, but there's just not that much fresh water on planet Earth. Marine ecosystems are far more common. They cover 75% of our surface, and there are three basic types, shallow ocean, deep water, and deep ocean bottom. In the shallow water, we study things like extremely biodiverse coral reefs. In deep water, we focus a lot on the tiniest of organisms, the large number of plankton and krill that support it. In fact, the Phytoplankton that you find in deep water perform about 40% of all photosynthesis that takes place on our planet. Protists really are the base of our food chain. On the ocean bottom, you can also find a wide variety of marine organisms that tend to have some very interesting energy capture techniques because they aren't commonly exposed to light. Finally, our third group are those terrestrial ecosystems. These are grouped into very large biomes. So we're thinking large scale communities of organisms that tend to be defined on land by the dominant types of plants and the general climate region that they sit in. Some examples are rainforests, savanna, deserts, grassland, temperate forests, and tundras. Keep in mind that there really is a lot of variability when we talk about ecosystems, as mentioned previously. You could be considering something as tiny as this little bitty tidal pool system or something as large as a rainforest. Some ecosystems vary greatly even if we don't think there will be a lot of variability between them. In this picture, in A, you can see Saguaro National Park in Arizona with a lot of plant life and some really interesting organisms but then you have the rocky desert of Boa Vista Island in South Africa that has no plant life whatsoever. So even within similar ecosystems, we have a lot of variability. Generally speaking, when we study ecosystems, we focus a lot on ecosystem disturbances, and that's because they're routinely exposed to a lot of things that can really affect their overall composition, which affects how the animals survive. A lot of disturbances are results of natural processes, but a lot of the times it can be human beings. We do things like alter environments through our agricultural practices, air pollution, we create acid rain, there's global deforestation, there's global deforestation happening, overfishing, oil spills, and illegal dumping that's affecting ecosystems worldwide. We focus on the equilibrium of an ecosystem. And that's the dynamic state of the ecosystem in which you have a pretty steady number of species and your levels of biodiversity maintain relatively constant. There are two parameters that we use to measure an ecosystem. We talk about its resistance and its resilience. The resistance of an ecosystem is its ability to remain at equilibrium despite of disturbances. Its resilience is how fast it goes back to that kind of resistant equilibrium state, even after something has disturbed it. Ecosystem resistance and resilience are especially important when we're talking about all of the things that humans can do to our environment. 
Eventually, we can damage an ecosystem so much that it's completely destroyed or we've irreversibly altered it, and that affects the life on the planet Earth overall. Commonly, we focus on trophic levels in ecosystems to focus on the different organisms and where their kind of importance lies. At the base of a trophic level, we have producers. Producers can take non-organic carbon and turn it into organic carbon, or essentially food for other organisms. You've probably learned this before in the food of a food in the form of a food pyramid or a food chain. Now we look at something a little bit more interlinking called a food web. But what we have are the producers that produce the energy that everyone else can consume. Primary consumers eat those producers, secondary consumers eat primary consumers, and apex or tertiary consumers eat everyone below. What we find is that there are changes in the number of relative energy in trophic levels as you head up towards those tertiary consumers. And that's because primary consumers aren't giving all of the energy that they created to the individuals who eat them because the producers have to keep themselves alive, they have to grow, and they have to reproduce. So every time you add a layer of consumer into your food web, that new layer is actually receiving less and less of the potential energy it could have gotten. You only pass on about 10% of your calories to an individual who eats you. So as you eat higher up on the food chain, you're essentially eating less and less economically. We can see that food web interactions between organisms cross trophic levels at many, many points. If you think about it, you might eat a deer, and deers actually sometimes enjoy eating bugs, and bugs eat plants, and plants are primary producers, and that makes you a tertiary consumer. Or you might have a really great salad for lunch, and that makes you a primary consumer. There's a lot of crossover in the food web, and this allows it to be a little bit more resilient when you have so much crossover and one link is damaged, you're still doing okay, but it actually impacts quite a few species. And this is why we're so concerned about extinction rates. So how do those organisms acquire energy in the food web? Let's talk a little bit more about that. Photosynthetic and chemiosynthetic organisms are those that we call autotrophs. They're capable of synthesizing their own food. Photosynthetic autotrophs photoautotrophs for, for short, use sunlight as an energy source, while chemoautotrophs use inorganic molecules as an energy source. Autotrophs are critical for most ecosystems because they are the producers that sit at that very bottom trophic level. They are the base of the food web. Photoautotrophs like plants, algae, and photosynthetic bacteria are the energy source for the majority of Earth's ecosystems. The rate at which those little guys are capable of producing energy and incorporating it into the food web is called the gross primary productivity of those autotrophs. The net primary productivity is the energy that remains inside of those producers once you account for the organism's natural respiration and heat loss that it uses to keep itself alive. So the net productivity is what's available to the next trophic level. A note on those chemoautotrophs, because we haven't touched, um, we haven't really talked about them, we haven't really touched on that topic a lot. These are primarily bacteria and archaea that are found in really rare ecosystems where sunlight is not available. So think really dark caves underground or hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the ocean. What we find is some very interesting creatures living at those vents. Shri uh, swimming shrimp, a few squat lobsters and hundreds of vent mussels can be seen in this image of a hydrothermal vent at the bottom of the ocean. No sunlight comes down to this depth, so the ecosystem is supported by chemoautotrophic bacteria and organic matter that sink from the ocean's surface. There aren't any photosynthesizers down here, hence the lack of that bright chlorophyll A green. Another important thing to consider as we talk about trophic levels is the fact that some things don't leave an organism. So we've been mentioning that calories get used and energy gets used and less and less of it gets passed on. 
In some instances, when something can't be used, it all gets passed on. We focus on PVCs, which is a, uh, a plastic, and we find that these really tiny plastics are being incorporated into all levels of our food chain because they're so tiny, they're in the water and they're being incorporated into the bodies of phytoplankton, which are eaten by mussels. But because the phytoplankton never used any of those PVCs, any PVC that it's encountered in its lifespan is going to be taken into that zebra mussel. When the zebra mussels are eaten by suckerfish, they get all of the PVCs accumulated in all of the zebra mussels that ate all of that phytoplankton. As you go up the chain, you find that these animals have higher and higher level of PVCs in their body. There's a new documentary, or new season of documentary essentially coming out known as Planet Earth, and in it, they watch a calf that dies because its mother's milk was poisoned due to plastic it had inside of its body after eating it from accumulated food. On a happier note, let's switch to the conversations of the individual biomes. We're going to talk about um, the different ecosystems and kind of give you an idea of what we have in each category. The vast majority of water on our planet is salt water. 97.5% of our water is salt water. So there's only 2.5% of it that's fresh water. Even of that fresh water though, the vast majority of it is held in glaciers and as snow cover. Even um, a large portion of even what's left over is kept underground. So it's not something in which many animals can live. And we end up with only 0.3% of our fresh water as lakes and rivers. All water on our planet thankfully goes through the water cycle. I'm assuming you've probably seen this like this guy before. Water from land in the oceans enters the atmosphere by evaporation or sublimation, where it condenses into the clouds and then falls as precipitation. You know, rain, snow, sleet, hail. Precipitated water might enter down into a freshwater body or it might be soaked up into the soil. The cycle is complete when the surface or groundwater re-enters the ocean eventually. There is a lot of movement of water on our planet and it kind of helps to keep everything um, flowing and we find that a lot of water brings different chemicals, nutrients, and minerals with it as it goes through the water cycle. One of the really important things that is moved with the water cycle as well as just basic gas exchange is carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide gas exists in the atmosphere and is dissolved in water. Photosynthesis converts carbon dioxide gas into organic carbon. The respiration cycles of bring organic carbon back as carbon dioxide gas. Of course, we know that CO2 is breathed out thanks to mitochondria. The long-term storage of organic carbon occurs when matter from living organisms is buried very, very deep underground and becomes fossilized. Volcanic activity and far more recently, human emissions bring stored carbon back into the carbon cycle. Carbon, especially carbon dioxide gas, acts like a blanket over the top of planet Earth. And the more carbon dioxide gas you have in the environment, the warmer our planet is because it traps heat just like air trapped in a fluffy ski jacket. That's why we're so concerned about all that fossilized carbon being burned and releasing CO2 gas back into this carbon cycle. It'll take a long time to trap it again. Another chemical that we commonly study when we look at our ecosystems as a whole is nitrogen. Nitrogen enters the living world from the atmosphere through nitrogen fixing bacteria. This nitrogen and nitrogenous waste that comes from animals is processed back into gaseous nitrogen by bacteria that lives inside of our soil. This also helps terrestrial food webs because nitrogen is required and it can be introduced into the environment when some of these bacteria and protists are eaten. The last cycle that we'll look at for at least a little while is the phosphorus cycle. In nature, phosphorus exits as a phosphate ion. Weathering, or phosphorus exists as a phosphate ion, excuse me, weathering of rocks and volcanic activity releases phosphate into our soil, water, and our air. 
where it becomes available for various terrestrial food webs. Phosphate enters into the ocean when water flows down into it, and they can also sink down into our groundwater and flow through our rivers. Phosphate dissolved in the ocean cycles into various marine food webs where it plays an important role as well. Some phosphate from marine food webs falls all the way down to the ocean floor where it forms solid sediment. There are some dead zones, however, where there's far too much phosphorus and nitrogen. These chemicals can be dangerous and they cause excessive growth of certain microorganisms which then use up way more oxygen in the environment than they should be and all the local plants die. Because the plants die, the animals that depend on those plants then die and you end up, like I mentioned, with these ecological dead zones. This is a satellite image of the Chesapeake Bay, which is an ecosystem that has been decimated by excess phosphate and nitrogen runoff. There are a lot of people, private scientific groups, the Army Corps of Engineers that's working incredibly hard to bring life back into the bay, which used to support a lot of people in Maryland due to things like crab fishing and um, lobster catching, mussel catching, all of those things. But the area is just, it's overrun with bacteria and organisms that thrive off of this excess phosphate and nitrate, depleting the oxygen for other plants. The very last cycle for today is sulfur dioxide. Sulfur dioxide from the atmosphere becomes available to terrestrial and marine ecosystems when it gets dissolved in rain. And the rain falls as really weak um, sulfuric acid rain, or it can actually fall directly to the earth as fallout if it's in a really, really high concentration. The weathering of rocks can also make different sulfates available to terrestrial ecosystems. Decomposition of living organisms can return some of these sulfates to the ocean, soil, and atmosphere as they get carried throughout the planet, yet generally speaking, following the rocks or the, uh, the water cycle. We do have some sulfur vents that are naturally releasing sulfur into the air. Here's a picture of a sulfur vent at Volcanic National Park in northeastern California. They're really um, yellowish sulfur deposits that build up at the mouth of these vents. You can see them at places like Yellowstone National Park as well. Now that we kind of have a basic idea of what's going on and in our biosphere as a whole, let's take a look at some of the different ecosystems. This map shows you how all the ecosystems are laid out over the world. You have a lot of tropical rainforests along the equator where the weather is the most constant and then savannas and deserts at the poles and a little bit of everything else in between depending on the elevation of those given areas. Tropical rainforests have long days. Every day has about 10 to 11 sun hour light, um, light hours per day. Some places have extremely high precipitation, others do not. Up to 300 species of trees can be found in a single hectare. And there are many layers to these forests with shrubs on the ground that receive little sunlight to trees that are hundreds of feet tall and have huge canopies with the ability to capture trillions of photons of light in any given day. Insects, frogs, monkeys, bats, birds, and primates all, found, all find their home among the beautiful fauna. A savanna is a biome that is dominated by grasses and scattered trees. Rainfall is lower and the soil tends to be poorer. Repeated fires with high temperatures and low moistures make the situation a whole lot worse. Deserts, as we well know here, are the driest of all biomes. It's hot, it's dry, we don't really have seasons, but we do have some beautiful flowers and great hiking trails. This looks a bit like our desert here in Mojave County, but it's actually a chaparral. There are dense, spiny shrubs and plants with the evergreen style of leaves. This type of biome exists in some areas of California and actually near the Mediterranean Sea. You often see deer, fruit-eating birds, and seed-eating rodents in these locations. Temperate grasslands are areas with, um, without trees or vast treeless areas, and they tend to be found in relatively cold locations with low levels of rain. Large grazing mammals like bison and pronghorns uh, often live here. 
Temperate broadleaf forests grow in the mid-latitude regions. Many of the trees are deciduous, so the ones that drop their leaves in fall. Temperate forests have cold winters and relatively warm summers, although um, not quite Arizona hot. The trees tend to be more uniform, and the soil is incredibly rich with organic and inorganic materials. Coniferous forests are forests with cone-bearing trees. The northern coniferous forest in Canada is the largest single biome that exists on our planet. Its long, cold winters and short, wet summers kind of help keep it consistent. The soil isn't great because the pine needles don't contain much nutrient material, so you don't have a lot of nutrients from them when they do fall, and they don't support a lot of life. Animals like elk, hare, bears, wolves, and birds do tend to make homes in these forests, however. A tundra, or a marshy plain, tends to exist between a coniferous forest and a polar ice cap. The soil is permanently frozen and therefore called permafrost. It keeps moist roots from growing into the soil and therefore most plants from growing. When it does get warm enough, the plants that can survive there grow in thick bursts of plant life, which causes a rush um, for the animals who live there to eat as much as they possibly can before they go back into a low energy hibernation like state. Let's move now from the land to the water and consider aquatic biomes. Aquatic biomes are some of the most beautiful biomes in the world. Your marine ecosystems have high variability among themselves. Some are under little, um, little pressure with tons of sunlight and a lot of organic materials, while others are under immense pressure and are exposed to almost no light and have almost no energy within them. There are different realms that we study in the ocean. It's divided into zones based on water depth, distance from the shoreline, and how much light uh, penetration it gets. The pelagic zone is all ocean water, and then the sea floor itself, we call it the benthic realm. The zone with light present is called the photic zone. Areas of shallow water, because the side of the continents are right there, we refer to as continental shelves. Photosynthesis takes place in these regions in massive quantities by phytoplankton and zooplankton. Below the photic zone is what we call the aphotic zone, also known as twilight. There's just a little bit light there, so generally speaking, um, fish that live here swim into the light zone, kind of have lunch, and then swim back down into the zone while they, uh, where they live. The uh, abyssal zone has no light whatsoever and the creatures here are very 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 different than what we traditionally think of when ocean comes to mind. Coral reefs are one of the most kind of popular things when we talk about the ocean because they are so beautiful. They are formed by calcium carbonate skeletons of corals where you have a lot of marine invertebrates um, and a lot of members of phylum Cnidaria. These are some of your th uh, really really shallow ocean zones usually there's only you know five or six feet of water above these corals because they need so much sunlight an ocean zone we don't always think about are the estuaries estuaries is where fresh water and salt water meet organisms here are capable of generally living in some pretty extreme environments they might be underwater in a tide or being smashed against you know rocks during high tide an estuary is, uh, it's kind of a crazy place to live. There are certain creatures that only enter them in order to lay eggs or have a more protected space to have their babies. Freshwater resources can be really different. It depends on what kind of freshwater you're looking at. In this picture, you can see a, an algal bloom in a freshwater canal that's contained inside of a zoo. Freshwater contained in enclosed environments tends to have more of these extreme issues because there aren't as many natural controls. We can consider freshwater in you know rivers that are really narrow and really shallow and move crazy fast which have completely different ecologies than water that is um, wide and deep and really slow moving which is of course completely different than water in like the Everglades where you have sawgrass marshes and cypress swamps and mangrove forests. You have 
a lot of variability in our aqueous environments, even though we don't always think about it as being quite as different as the tundra versus the desert versus the rainforest. But with that, we reach the end of chapter 20. You should read your book and take notes in your own words. Consider a lot of visuals. Maybe take a look at planet Earth and then take a crack at your homework.